It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. Ah, yes, the magnificent Trolley Sour Bright Crawler, also known as Trollicus Brightolus. The worm's captivating neon colour makes it an easy gummy prey. Trolley! It's a surprisingly sour, invitingly chewy... Staggeringly snackable species unlike anything else found on this planet. Eat me! Delicious. Visit trolley.com to shop now. Trolley, eat me! Hiding a secret, he skulks through the swamps, hungry and confused. Knowing early in the night that his secret needed to stay hidden, he slips deeper into the bayou. As the moon rose high into the night sky, fangs began to emerge from his gums, and his fingernails began to grow painfully, forming long, sharp claws. The hunger in his belly began to grow too, also painful, gnawing at his insides, begging to be fed. As his sense of smell sharpened, his memories of who he was and why he was here began to dull until they faded completely. The moon was full and at its peak when he was drawn by the sounds, the smells, and the hunger to a place that was familiar, to a place that he, for the moment, had forgotten was his home. Welcome to Freaky Folklore, the podcast where we discover the horrifying legends across the world and tell terrifying tales of monsters both ancient and modern. This week we are discussing the Rougarou, a menacing Cajun werewolf. This show is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network. Find more terrifying tales at EerieCast.com and be sure to follow us on Spotify or your favorite podcasting service. You can leave an honest review on iTunes, too. The more we get, the more we grow. And hopefully, the more monsters we can explore. If you would like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to carmencarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N-C-A-R-R-I-L-N at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook for information on future episodes. The sun was sinking low over the Atchafalaya Basin, and the mosquitoes were starting to form large swarms around the cabin. The humming insects were always present, but multiplied rapidly as the sun began to set. The crickets had begun to play the tune of their evening song, while a row of turtles sat on a log in front of the cabin, listening. The thick tupelo gum trees surrounding the cabin cast a jungle-like feeling, making it seem later than it was. A large bullfrog jumped onto the log, startling the turtles who dove into the water for refuge as the frog pulled its back legs up out of the water. Moments later, the turtles emerged from the water and climbed back onto the log to join their amphibious cousin as they watched the sunset together. The peaceful sounds of the swamp came to a sudden halt when the walls of the small cabin began to shake. A human-like moan of agony could be heard coming from inside, and the frogs, turtles, and the crickets stopped to listen. When the moans turned into a slavering growl, the frog and the turtles retreated to the dark waters in unison. The growls grew louder as the sound of wood splintering could be heard coming from inside of the cabin. As the sun disappeared beyond the horizon, the growling ruckus stopped 
and was replaced by silence. The crickets resumed their tune, but as the moon made its way high into the sky, a howl pierced through the night. Charlie Landry almost dropped his paddle in the water when the howl tore through the marshes. He caught the tip with his boot just before it slid into the water. It was late to be out in the swamp, but he and his papa had trouble with the boat motor when they had reached the ramp that morning. They had 30 gator lines to bait and set before they could go home. Every line was important. The season only lasted 30 days, and gators were half of his family's annual income. If they did well, it could be more. He came from three generations of swampers that had all worked the Atchafalaya Basin. Charlie had been learning the gator business since he was eight years old. He was 16 when his papa's business partner had died suddenly. From that day on, he accompanied his papa on every hunting, fishing, and trapping trip that he had made. Today had been a bad start to the season, but staying out late and getting the line set would make up for it, he hoped. He was shaken by the eerie howl that drifted through the night air. It had cut right through the sounds of the frogs and the insects, bringing a chilling silence. The only sound was the soft hum of the boat motor and the water slapping the sides of the boat. Charlie looked at his papa, and without having to ask him, his papa looked away before saying, probably a coyote looking for a mate. We should hurry up and get back. Your mama is probably worried sick. But Charlie knew the swamps almost as well as his papa, and he knew that that was no coyote. Creoles were a superstitious bunch of people, and he had heard every myth, and he believed every one of them. He didn't argue, even though he could tell his papa was a bit nervous, trying to hurry where before he was relaxed and focused on the task of setting the lines. After Charlie had tied off the last hook and set the bait, his father started the boat and swung it back out, heading down the bayou towards home. As the boat made its full turn and began to pick up speed, the motor began to sputter. Not again, Charlie groaned. His father grunted as he turned to switch the motor off. It just needs to cool for a bit. I let her idle for too long. Charlie, stifling a yawn, began to organize the clutter laying around the boat, putting up the tools and equipment they had used that day. It was better to keep busy or he may doze off. He was locking the tackle box when his papa shushed him. Shh! Did you hear that? Charlie listened and looked around on each side of the riverbanks. I don't hear anything. But just as he said it, he did hear something. Something was moving amongst the trees, making heavy splashing sounds in the water. They sat and listened, and as they did, they could make out the direction of the movement. It was directly across from them, near the line they had just hung, and it was moving, as if it was pacing back and forth. Charlie was sure that he could hear heavy breathing between splashes. Suddenly the splashing stopped and the breathing turned to a low, rumbling growl. Charlie, very slowly, reached down into that well and grabbed the spotlight. His papa ordered in almost a whisper. Charlie did as he was told, using his headlamp to find the spotlight. He pulled it out and flipped the on switch. As he scanned the trees, the growling got louder until he found its source. Two glowing red eyes were staring back at him, unflinching in the bright light. Whatever you do, Charlie, do not take the light off of it, his papa ordered. He could hear his papa as he began the process to try and start the boat, and to his relief, it fired up on the first try. They took off so fast that Charlie fell and crashed to the floor of the boat, banging his head on one of the metal seats. He barely noticed the pain in his head or the blood starting to trickle. All he could think about was the loud splashing and a growl that had turned into a roar as something began chasing the boat. 
Whatever it was, it was huge and it was fast. It kept pace with the boat until they finally reached a fork in the river, bringing them to more open water. As the boat picked up speed, the sounds finally began to fade into the distance. They didn't talk on the ride back. His papa kept the boat cranked so high they couldn't hear each other even if they had tried. But as soon as they docked the boat onto the trailer and climbed into the truck, his papa gave him a stern warning. Charlie, tell no one what we saw tonight. Charlie looked at him puzzled. Did you look into its eyes? His papa asked. Charlie, remembering those glowing red eyes, answered, I saw its eyes. Not sure whether I was looking into them or not. His paw frowned. Let's not talk about it anymore. Beware the curse, Charlie. Beware the curse. This episode is sponsored by Athletic Greens. I started taking AG1 because lately I've had trouble with a lack of energy, focus, and alertness. But now I feel more aware and invigorated. AG1 is a drink mix with 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens which support gut health, your nervous system, immune system, energy, and more. I drink AG1 every morning for breakfast. It helps me stay focused on work throughout the day. Plus, it has a delicious, mild, tropical taste, making it easy to drink. I even look forward to it, and so does my husband. For less than $3 a day, you're investing in your health with a lifestyle-friendly mix, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. Plus, your subscription comes with a year's supply of vitamin D, which is very important for the lack of sunlight in winter months. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash folklore. Again, that is athleticgreens.com forward slash folklore to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. This episode is sponsored by Body Art Forms. I am a huge fan of body art, so I was excited when I discovered Body Art Forms, a tiny Texas company that sells body jewelry to people like me. They are a small business that have served the pierced and modified community since 2001. I found a wide selection of jewelry on their website, and not just for piercings. When I placed my first order, it took less than a week for it to arrive in the mail, and I was pleased with each piece. Everything came in neat individual packages. Body Art Forms is driven by three major factors. They strive to give the best customer service. They believe in careers and make sure all their employees earn a living wage. 20% of all profits go to charitable causes. At Body Art Forms can be found on all social media platforms, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Pinterest. You can check out their diverse selection at bodyartforms.com. That's B-O-D-Y-A-R-T-F-O-R-M-S dot com. Just enter the coupon code FREAKY at checkout for 15% off any purchase. This episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Attention all mystery lovers. Dive into the captivating world of June's Journey, the hidden object game that will awaken your inner detective. Join June Parker on her quest to uncover the shocking truth behind her sister's murder in the glamorous 1920s. I'm a couple of chapters in, and I love unlocking new pieces to the mystery after each hidden item search. The beautifully detailed scenes, from New York's finest parlors to the charming sidewalks of Paris, make the experience truly immersive. As you progress, you'll also get to build and customize your very own island estate complete with stunning gardens and luxurious buildings. Gather compelling evidence, decipher cleverly hidden clues, and unravel the dark secrets of the Parker family. Each twist and turn will keep you on the edge of your seat, eager to crack the case. Cooperate or compete against other players in the detective club, and you'll even get a chance to play in a detective league to test your skills. Are you ready to jump back in time, detectives? 
Download June's Journey for free today in iOS and Android. The Rougarou appears in medieval French folklore. The 16th century monster was used as a scapegoat for crimes and misdeeds of others. It was easier to blame vanished children, stolen property, or mysterious happenings on a monster than going through the more complicated criminal investigations. If a villager was displaying strange behavior, it often caused them to be condemned as one of these beasts. The suspected criminal would then be put on trial and most often found guilty by the court. Eventually, the Catholic Church caught on and began to use belief in the creature to ensure that its followers obeyed the rules of Lent. If one refused to observe Lent for seven consecutive years, legend says that he would be transformed into a beast called the Loop Guru, also known as the Rue Guru. The legend of the Rue Guru seems to have traveled from France to anywhere in the world that French people settled. Loop is French for wolf, and Guru comes from the Frankish word Gourouf, which also means wolf. As the Loup Guru traveled to southern Louisiana with the Acadian people, who were exiled from French Canada, its name evolved to Rougarou. But even today, you may hear it called both, as they are used interchangeably. Since the migration of the French, the stories began to change to match the times and the dialect. Since the Cajun dialect is a mixture of French and English words, the word changed over time. Rougarou rolls easier off the tongue than Loup Guru. The legends differ from place to place. Some believe that the beast hunts down Catholics who do not follow the rules of Lent, just like in the olden days. Others believe that the Rougarou is under a 101-day curse, and on the last day, the curse will be transferred to the first victim the beast drew blood from. On the sunset of that day, the victim will turn into a Rougarou, and the original Rougarou will return permanently to his human form. There is a story about a woman who walked into the woods and came face to face with a Rougarou. When she locked eyes with the creature, its curse was lifted, and it returned to its human form. Knowing how the curse was supposed to work, the woman returned home to her husband, but kept it secret until the 101 days was up. There are varying theories on how one may become a Rougarou besides this. First, if you kill one of these beasts and are exposed to its blood, you may become infected and become a Rougarou. Next, if you witness the death of one of these creatures, you must keep it a secret for an entire year. If you tell anyone before the year is up, the curse will fall upon you. It is also believed by some that if you have the misfortune to be cursed by a witch, you may become a Rougarou as well. The Rougarou looks similar in most descriptions. It has a human body and stands seven to eight feet tall. Even though the beast has a human body, it has the head of a wolf, with razor-sharp teeth and claws. Some believe you may never look into its eyes, or you may become one yourself. If you have the misfortune to become a Rougarou, you may be able to keep your secret, but only for a short while. You will retain your human form during the day, but appear sickly and weak. But beware, when the sun sets you will turn into a bloodthirsty monster, prowling around the swamps and bayous of Louisiana, and sometimes within the city of New Orleans. You will have an insatiable appetite for human flesh, and sadly, you may prefer the flesh of those you know. There are ways to defend yourself against the Rougarou if you do not become one. Like the English werewolf, silver is the beast's weakness. A silver bullet or a silver stake through the heart should do the trick. But just to be safe, you should probably take off its head too. It is also believed that if you shoot, stab, or injure a Rougarou, it will return to its human form as soon as the first drop of blood is spilled. According to legend, the Rougarou is not the brightest of creatures, but you can use this to your advantage to protect yourself. To outsmart a Rougarou, you need only to lay 13 small objects like coins or beans by your doors and windows. An approaching Rougarou will stop and attempt to count the objects, but it can only count to 12. 
The Rougarou will become perplexed by the number of coins, but will continue repeatedly to attempt to count the coins. He will not stop trying until the sun rises when he will leave and become human again. I had to stop here and laugh as I visualized the large werewolf-type creature staring at 13 coins with a baffled look while scratching his head. It made me think of my dog when I step on his squeaky toy, but hey, if it works, do it. The Rougarou legend has made a huge impact on popular culture, especially in the South where stories are told and retold about a creature that stalks the swamps and bayous. In Houma, Louisiana, a festival is thrown in the fall to celebrate the rich folklore that exists along the bayous of Southeast Louisiana. The Rougarou Fest is a family-friendly festival with a spooky flair. The festival offers live music, cultural activities, children's activities, Cajun food, carnival rides, and a parade called the Crew Guru. The Rougarou Fest was ranked as one of the top 10 costume parties in the United States by USA Today in 2014. The best thing about the festival is that all proceeds go to the South Louisiana Wetlands Discover Center, a nonprofit organization that educates people on Louisiana's disappearing coast. The legend of the Rougarou has traveled all around the world, but has left a special impression in Cleveland, Ohio, where you will find the Cedar Point Amusement Park. This park is home to the Rougarou roller coaster, and it claims to feed on screams. The terrifying ride boasts a height of 145 feet and travels at 60 miles per hour for a total of 2 minutes and 30 seconds. As soon as you are strapped in, the floor drops out. Through twists and turns with your feet dangling in midair, the coaster drops down hills at high speeds and travels through swamps. This ride is not for the squeamish and claims to leave you wondering if you will ever catch your breath. And when the ride is over, its howls will follow you around all day. In 2016, the Rougarou joined the world of Arkham Horror. Arkham Horror, the card game, is a cooperative living card game set amid a backdrop of Lovecraftian horror. As the Ancient Ones seek entry to our world, one to four investigators work to unravel arcane mysteries and conspiracies. Their efforts determine not only the course of your game, but carry forward throughout whole campaigns, challenging them to overcome their personal demons even as Arkham Horror the card game blurs the distinction between the card game and role-playing experiences. When one reporter's sensational news about a series of savage killings fails to make its way into the Arkham Advertiser, your friend at that establishment decides to contact you, nonetheless deeming the reports the sort of thing that might suit your eccentric curiosities. She's right, of course, and when you head to Northside Station to book your ticket for New Orleans, you can't possibly imagine the full shape of the horrors that await you. If you search, you will find short films, books, TV stories, and sports teams who have featured the Rougarou in stories and as inspiration. In September 2021, Skinwalker, The Howl of the Rougarou, a werewolf documentary, was released. The film delves into the unanswered questions. Do werewolves exist? Does the Rougarou still stalk the swamps of southern Louisiana? The documentary also takes you through the history of the legend and discusses a cannibal tribe of shapeshifters who retreated deep into the forest, where they slowly lost touch with their humanity. Whether myth, legend, or bloodthirsty reality, the Rougarou holds strong in the ranks as a terrifying creature of the night. The monster holds strong in stories and in the nightmares of people from the south. It wouldn't be wise to go searching the bayous for confirmation of this monster's existence, because if it's out there and you find it, the possible outcome is most likely fatal. This episode is brought to you by The Weather Channel. The key to solving any mystery? Smart decisions based on the facts. In the case of the weather's effect on your well-being, turn to the Weather Channel app. It clues you in on how weather shapes your mood, health, and productivity with insights built on reliable forecast data to help you thrive. Because mystery belongs in true crime, not weather. Be a force of nature with the Weather Channel app. 
Charlie was tired the next morning when his papa woke him. He had nightmares all night about those red eyes. He dreamed that he was being chased through the swamp. He could hear salivated snarls from behind him and the splashing of large feet. He was exhausted when they started their morning right as the sun was rising, but his papa insisted that they get done before dark today. So they headed off early without breakfast back into the swamps. The catch was great, a gator on each of the first three lines they checked. Charlie was so tired he thought he may pass out by the time they pulled the third one into the boat. It was 10 feet long and had to be about 500 pounds or so, he guessed. By the end of the day, they had bagged five total. The weight was enough to make Charlie worry that the boat might sink. Of course, he knew better, but he was paranoid from his exhaustion. He had not only been tired all day, but nervous. He seemed to jump every time a startled heron would take to flight, or an overly large toad made a splash when jumping into the water. His papa had noticed how jumpy he was, so that night before bed he told Charlie he could take the day off. You need to catch up on your schoolwork anyway. I called your Uncle JR and he said he could go out with me tomorrow. Charlie felt guilty but was relieved. Thanks, Papa, he said as his dad ruffled his hair just like he was still six years old. Another restless night found Charlie in the middle of a slightly different dream. He was in the swamp, barefooted, watching a wild hog wallowing in the mud. He suddenly felt hunger stir in his stomach and hunched lower into the reeds to keep from scaring his prey. He lunged at the unsuspecting hog and grabbed it by a hind leg. The hog was screaming in terror when he reached down to rip its neck open. That is when Charlie stopped. He noticed his large, hairy arms and the long, talon-like claws protruding from the ends of his fingers. The shock woke him, and he sat up in bed panting and covered in sweat. He didn't dream the rest of the night, but he didn't sleep much either. Something was wrong, terribly wrong, but he couldn't figure out what it was. The next morning after breakfast, Charlie hit the books. He loved schoolwork, especially science and math, but during gator season, he sometimes got behind. He was disappointed when his work was done and bored. He laid down on the couch to watch TV and fell asleep. He didn't dream. He finally got the rest he needed. When he woke, it was late afternoon, and Charlie felt like having some fun. He called his best friend Mick, who should be home from school by now. Catahoula, Louisiana is a small town and doesn't offer much in the way of entertainment for young people, but a favorite local hangout is Wayback's Arcade. Charlie found Mick playing a retro Cubert game in the back corner, just where he said he would be. Mick loved all the old Atari games and Charlie knew he would have to pull Mick away. So Charlie went and bought a cold Coke while he waited. Surprisingly, he only had to wait a few minutes. Mick had gotten rusty since school started, not to mention he ran out of quarters. The two boys had some catching up to do, so they walked down behind the businesses towards Little River, where they could skip rocks across the water. Mick was full of news about school. He was especially interested in a new girl that had moved there from Houston the week before. Charlie listened but drifted off a few times as Mick rambled on. Hey, what's itching you? Mitch asked him. You are awful distracted. Do you have your eye on someone? No. I have better things to do than chase girls. I was just thinking about something crazy that happened the other night when I was out with my papa, Charlie explained. Well, I don't know what could be crazier than girls, but I'm all ears, Mick laughed. My papa told me not to tell anyone about it. But if you can keep a secret... Come on, dude, you know my lips don't flap, Mick promised. But Charlie had to roll his eyes because he could remember a few times where Mick had not been able to stop his lips from flapping. He had to tell someone or he was going to go crazy. Maybe if he told Mick what he had seen, the nightmares would stop. So he did, 
He told him every detail, including his dreams. Dude, Mick began, that sounds like a Rougarou. If it was, then you are so screwed. My uncle saw one a couple of years ago, and he waited over a year to tell the story because he was afraid that if he did, he would turn into one. Charlie frowned. He didn't want to tell Mick anything else. Suddenly, he felt sick to his stomach and was ready to go home. He didn't want to listen to Mick's nonsense, and he wasn't even sure why he had told him. Back home, Charlie found his mama cooking dinner, and he gave her a quick peck on the cheek before heading to his room. Don't go to sleep. Supper will be ready soon, she yelled over her shoulder just as he shut the bedroom door. Plopping down on the bed, Charlie replayed what Mick had told him. He wasn't sure why it made him angry. It was as if he had been making fun of him when he wanted to be taken seriously. He was laying on his back watching the fan blades on the ceiling fan go round. They were making a swooshing sound as the whole fixture swung with the motion. Charlie began to feel dizzy, so he closed his eyes. Contrary to his mother's warning, he fell asleep. But when he woke up, he was no longer at home. The fan had been replaced by a canopy of tall cypress trees. So tall they must have been hundreds of years old. A warm breeze was caressing his skin, and the same breeze was making the branches of the trees sway. He could hear the frogs croaking from the bayou that must be nearby. Something was familiar about this place, but he didn't think about it for long. He suddenly realized that he should be at home, with his parents, eating supper. How had he gotten here? He must have fallen asleep, but he wasn't a sleepwalker. Confused and still trying to make sense of the situation, Charlie rolled over onto his knees and was about to use his hands to push himself off the ground when he saw the blood. It was caked under his fingernails and had crusted on his skin from his fingers all the way up to his chest. Charlie's heart began to race while his stomach began to heave. After his stomach calmed, he stood and began to run, following his instincts more than recognition. He ran as fast and as hard as he could, oblivious to the fact that he was completely naked. He emerged from the woods just behind his home. He stopped when he saw a police car in the driveway, immediately aware of his nakedness. He backed slowly behind a tree, looking to make sure the coast was clear before running for the back door. The door was locked. Charlie was beginning to panic. He would never live it down if anyone saw him this way. This was a small town, and everyone would hear about it. He edged his way towards his bedroom window, trying to make himself invisible by sheer will, but that is when they saw him. Stop right there, hands in the air. The command came from a familiar voice. Charlie Landry. We have been looking everywhere for you. Where the hell are your clothes? Charlie, hands still in the air, just stared at the ground. The deputy approached. He wasn't much older than Charlie. That is why the voice was familiar. It was Fred DuPont. Fred DuPont had been the star quarterback for Catahoula Parish's football team as a senior four years ago before he injured his knee. Fred grabbed a blanket from the trunk of his patrol car one of the old military-style ones that was more scratchy than warm. You can put your hands down now, Charlie. It's obvious you aren't carrying a weapon unless you hit it somewhere unmentionable. Fred wrapped the blanket around Charlie's shoulders and led him into the house. Charlie's mama was sitting at the kitchen table, and he could tell that she had been crying. Mama, what's wrong? What happened? He reached for her, but when he did, she jerked away causing a coffee cup to fall to the floor and shatter. Deputy Fred grabbed Charlie by the arm. We need to talk, but first you need to get some clothes on. He led Charlie to his room as if he didn't know how to find it himself. Charlie was beginning to feel even more uneasy. Fred reached ahead of him and opened the bedroom door and stepped aside. I'm going to leave the door ajar just to be safe. 
Charlie stepped into his bedroom and immediately saw that the window had been shattered, pain and all. Had someone broken into his house? So many possibilities were running through his mind. He walked towards the window and noticed that the debris of broken glass and wood was laying outside on the ground. Someone had broken out of his window. None of this made any sense. Charlie grabbed a hoodie and jeans that he had discarded the day before, threw them on quickly and headed back out the door. Fred was there waiting and grabbed Charlie by the arm again. Charlie Landry, you are under the arrest for the murder of your father, Charles Landry Sr. Charlie was dumbstruck. He had gone completely numb and could barely even feel his arms being pulled behind his back or the handcuffs being slapped on his wrists. They interrogated Charlie for hours, but he couldn't tell them anything past falling asleep in his room the night before. They took his picture, fingerprinted him, and then locked him in a jail cell with a guy who was clearly drunk. Charlie was still in shock. It was like a bad dream. How did he go from a regular kid to his papa's accused murderer in less than a day? He loved his papa. He would never hurt him. Just then, the impact of what all had taken place hit him like a ton of bricks. They said his papa's body had been found behind the house in the woods. The same woods he had woke up in. His body had been torn to shreds. Charlie could feel the sun begin to set even with the absence of a window in the small cell. It was as if something was tugging at his soul. When the moon began to creep higher into the night sky, he felt sharp pain in his fingertips and watched in awe as sharp gray claws dug their way out of his skin. He watched as hundreds of coarse brown and silver hairs began to sprout across his arms. That is when he knew what had happened to his papa. And sadly, he remembered his papa's last words. Tell no one. Suddenly his body contorted. Stretching and bending, his bones popped. The pain was excruciating. Charlie fell to his knees and began to forget who he was. Began to feel the hunger. A scream tore through the cell from behind him. The drunk had awoken to his surprise. But he wasn't awake for long. The scream was stifled by the sharp claws that swiftly ripped out his throat. Thank you for listening to Freaky Folklore, the podcast about mankind's horrifying legends and myths. Don't forget to follow Freaky Folklore on Spotify and iTunes. If you can, leave the show an honest review on iTunes to help us grow. Freaky Folklore is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network, the home for listeners who love to feel scared. Go to EerieCast.com to find other terrifying podcasts, such as Tales from the Break Room and Redwood Bureau. Tune in next week as we talk about the back rooms, a space that exists outside of reality. Until next time, stay safe out there. Because this world is a strange one.